Welcome to Perlman Quadrangle and Irvine Auditorium. Irvine Auditorium is a non-smoking facility. Restrooms are located on the lower and second balcony levels. Vending machines and payphones are located only on the lower level. Assisted listening devices are available upon request. Please take time to note the exit clearly marked at the front and rear of the auditorium. If for some reason there is an emergency, please use these exits to vacate the building in an orderly fashion. For your safety and the safety of others, after exiting, please move away from the building as far as possible. Cameras or recording devices are not permitted in the auditorium. Please take the time now to silence all cell phones or beepers for thorough enjoyment of today's presentation by yourself and others. Good afternoon and thank you for coming. Somewhere in the future, someone's going to say to you, do you remember that beautiful fall day once when we inaugurated a president, watched a Sheryl Crow concert, and then listened to a Supreme Court justice? <laughs> you're you're, you're going to say, yes, I remember that. <clears throat> Many of you were here for the first of those events this morning, the inauguration of our new president, Liz McGill. It was a magnificent ceremony, and I was privileged to officiate. Uh, this afternoon, with a little less pomp and circumstance, we continue our celebration with what promises to be a terrific program. We are so honored that United States Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan is here to help celebrate the inauguration. In just a moment, she and President McGill will have a discussion touching on a number of timely topics, including some of the questions submitted by you. Before they begin, let me tell you a little bit about our esteemed guest. Justice Kagan is a native of New York City. After graduating from Harvard Law School, she clerked for Judge Abner Mikva at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and for Justice Thurgood Marshall at the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Kagan served for four years in the Clinton administration as associate counsel for the, to the president and then as deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy. Between 2003 and 2009, she served as dean of the Harvard Law School. In 2009, President Obama nominated her as the Solicitor General of the United States. A year later, President Obama nominated her as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court on May 10, 2010. She took her seat a few months later in August of 2010. Justice Kagan and President McGill have a great deal in common. In their careers have followed remarkably similar paths. Like Justice Kagan, President McGill has served in government. After graduating from Yale with her undergraduate degree in history, she worked for four years as a Senior Legislative Assistant for Energy and Natural Resources for U.S. Senator Kent Conrad. President McGill was also a law professor. She taught for 15 years at UVA, her law school alma mater. They both led prestigious law schools. President McGill was dean of Stanford Law from 2012 to 2019. Perhaps most interesting, they also both worked beside the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Kagan was her colleague on the Supreme Court for 10 years, and President McGill was a law clerk in Justice Ginsburg's, cham Ginsburg's chambers in the mid-1990s. I'm guessing they will have a lot to discuss. Please help me give a warm welcome to Penn President Liz McGill and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan. Welcome, everybody. It's, it's fabulous to see you, and such a distinct honor and pleasure to be hosting uh, Justice Kagan here today. Thanks for being with us. Pleasure to be here. Can I say a few words before you? Of course you yeah? can. Yeah? Always. Well, congratulations, first of all. It's your inauguration, right? It is. Yeah. It is. And in my law crowds, everybody said it's her investiture. <laughs> but uh, but I, it's your inauguration. Congratulations. It's fabulous. Thank you very And much. congratulations to the entire Penn community as well. Um, because, you know, Liz and I, it, you, uh, you just heard, we share a bunch of things in common. And we go back a long way, and I can tell the entire Penn community that they've got the real deal here. So, um, it's great. It's great. you're going to get, I think, a lot of innovative ideas, a lot of good sense, judgment, a lot of integrity, all wrapped up in one package. So you. you're a lucky university. Thank you so much. That's incredibly kind. I hope I can live up to that billing. So appreciate it. 
Well, you better. <laughs> Uh, so our, our board chair gave a, a biographical sketch in the introduction of you, um, and I wanted to just start with a straightforward question, which is, you could have done so many things, uh, and you chose law. Why did you choose law? Mm, not sure the premise is right, and, you know. <laughs> I may have chose the only thing I'm good at, so. Uh, uh, I think I chose law for all the wrong reasons. It, it sound, I just realized you were a history major too. I was. I was a history major at Princeton, and uh, I was kind of intending to go on and get a PhD in history, and uh, then my senior thesis did me in. Um, uh, because, you know, my senior thesis is a history major. I spent a lot of time in, an, in a dusty archive, mm -hmm. and, um, and I thought, you know, this is just a little bit too cloistered, a little bit less... Uh, not enough contact with the real world, with human beings. I just didn't feel as though I would be happy doing it for my entire life, although I still read a lot of history, love history. Um, but I, I probably then went to law school for all the wrong reasons. I mean, at that time, law school was somewhat less expensive than it is now, and, and it was a common thing, I think, back then in the 80s, for people to say things like, um, I'm going to law school to keep my options open, mm. or mm -hmm. I'm going to law school because I don't really quite know what else to do. And um, I, I once was uh, talking to a crowd of prospective students, this was when I was dean at Harvard, mm -hmm. and, and, and I heard myself saying, don't go to law school because you can't think of anything else to do. And I thought, that's why I went to law school. <laughs> Um, but whatever, you know, uh, bad reason took me to law school, I, I was very lucky because I really walked in the door and from the very first moment, I loved it. And what I loved about it was um, that it's you know, incredibly intellectually stimulating. It's like a gigantic puzzle if you're a person who likes analytical sort of puzzles. But at the same time, it makes a real difference in the world. And so the combination of those two things, something that was analytically extremely demanding and where you could also see how it could um, lead to uh, y y y y have an impact in the world and in people's lives, mm -hmm. uh, that's, it, that's what I loved. Mm -hmm. We have some law students in the audience today. Is there anything you wish you knew when you started law school as you look back on it? Uh, not really. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I think I did it okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you have had the rare experience of working. Work hard, make friends, oh. you know, all the obvious stuff, oh, right? Exactly. Yeah. You've had the rare. Get to know your professors. <laughs> Anything else? No. <laughs> You have had a rare experience, I think, in working in the judiciary, obviously, now at the highest level of the judiciary, the White House as both a legal and a policy advisor, uh, in the Department of Justice, representing the United States before the Supreme Court as Solicitor General, and as a professor and academic leader in the Legal Academy. So where did you learn the most? It used to be, but can I interrupt you for Please, a second? of course. It used to be uh, that people would you know, give one of those kinds of introductions and list all these different, and I would come out and my standard line was, now you know, can't keep a job. <laughs> but you can't but say, I feel you can't as though I can't say that anymore, <laughs> yeah. You've got some real longevity in this, in this current game, exactly. <laughs> okay, okay, where so did I where learn? did you leave yeah. the most, and, and maybe with attention to your current role as justice of the Supreme Court? Okay, so that narrows it down some, because I learned something in all of those different places, mm -hmm. um, and you know, mostly the reason I couldn't keep a job was I have actually this view of like when the learning curve flattens out, that's mm -hmm. the time to start um, keeping your eyes open for something else, and the, the most fun part of a job is, is, is when the learning curve is steepest. Um, but I guess if you think of, uh, like what, has, uh, what prepared me to be a justice, I would say two things. Um, I mean, certainly the Solicitor General role, and we can talk more about that. Um, but the other thing was uh, teaching. And, and by that I mean the real teaching part of teaching, not the research and not um, so much the deaning, but the real teaching part of teaching because 
uh, still, you know, I've been doing this, this is my 13th year on the court, um, strikes me as amazing. Um, but still, when I sit down and I write an opinion, what I really think to myself is uh, how would I teach this to a, a crowd of students? You know, you have a, you walk into a classroom and they're a group of smart people, but they don't know all that much. And the question is, you know, how are you going to convey really uh, hard, sometimes abstruse subject matter? Mm -hmm. And how are you going to do it in a way that makes it stick? That, so that, that it's not just like it, they understand it as it flies by, but that they can, you know, think about it six months or a year or ten years later, and and something will stick with them. And 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 I think you know I used to do this very consciously in my first few years, and I think I still do it subconsciously. That when I write an opinion and I say, how do I explain this? You know, I'm, what I'm thinking is like. How do I explain this to educated Americans, you know, people who are interested in the court enough to pick up an opinion, but not necessarily lawyers, let alone specialized lawyers, and how am I going to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it? And the best way I know how to do that is to put myself back into that mindset of how am I going to teach this class. Uh, I, I wonder if this tradition still exists, that the justices have tea or lunch or something with the clerks of the other chambers. Okay, so. You say tea because Justice Ginsburg always had tea. He did have tea. The rest of us do not do tea, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, yeah. Okay, well, uh, so uh, when I was uh, clerking for the justice, uh, when we went to lunch with Chief Justice Rehnquist, at lunch, he decided to initiate a conversation about what was the best job in law. This is when he was Chief Justice of the United States. Uh -huh. uh, and his best job, in law, best job in law, according to him, was directing the Office of Legal Counsel, which is a job He said better than the job he currently than, held. Yes, and uh -huh. we said, Mr. Chief Justice, you currently have a pretty great job. He's like, no, 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 absolutely. Directing the Office of Legal Counsel, best job in law, and he had yeah. reasons for it. So my question for you is, what's the best job in law? SG, S Solicitor General. Ah, and yeah. why? Um, so um, first, let me, should I say what a Solicitor General does please. or is? Yes. Because maybe not everybody yes, knows. Do. But um, So a Solicitor General is the person in the Department of Justice that uh, who coordinates all the work um, uh, in the appellate courts, particularly in the Supreme Court, but in the appellate courts more broadly, for the United States. So you represent the United States in the entire Court of Appeal system, and particularly in the Supreme Court. Uh, and you make all the decisions, I mean you have a staff and they help you a lot, but you make all the decisions about what appeals to take, what appeals not to take, what positions to take in appellate cases, including in Supreme Court cases, and you argue uh, cases in front of the Supreme Court, occasionally in other appellate courts, but not usually. Mostly you go up to the Supreme Court once a month for each sitting, and you argue the most important case that the United States has an interest in. It's really a quite extraordinary job. I did it um, for only a small amount of time before President Obama put me on the court, um, a little bit more than one entire Supreme Court term. But it was, it was a fantastic job. And you know, it's, not, it's funny that uh, Chief, Chief Justice Rehnquist said that. So I clerked for Justice Marshall, as, the, um, as Mr. Box said. And um, Justice Marshall was one of my predecessors as Solicitor General. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if you had asked Justice Marshall what was his best job in law, now remember, this is a person who was not only a Supreme Court Justice, but who is the head of the Legal Defense Fund and in that role has reshaped all of American society. Mm -hmm. But if you asked Justice Marshall what was his best job in law, he would say being Solicitor General. And this idea of, for him, I mean, had just a special meaning and resonance, the idea of this black man walking up to a podium and saying, I am here to represent the United States when, you know, in his prior legal career, you know, he was run out of town on a rail mm -hmm. as he traversed uh, different um, courtrooms across the southern, southern United States. It just, it meant an enormous amount to him from that perspective. But I think also, he would tell you, as I would, it's just an awesome job um, where uh, you're, you're, you're making these big decisions. I mean, of course, you have bosses, 
Um, but really, things very, you very rarely go up to the attorney general and the presidency, and you're making these big decisions about litigation strategy, about litigation positions of the United States all across the government. One of my favorite parts of the job, I mean, the U.S. government, it turns out, is a big place, and <laughs> it's not so easy often to figure out what the interest of the United States is. I think we always call it the long-term interest of the United States, although it often had a short-term dimension as well. Um, but different people had different ideas of what those were. So, so one of the jobs of the Solicitor General is to convene these large meetings with you know, every agency under the sun mm. and listen to all of them. And, um, uh, and, and then only, only after doing that and realizing like, what the different stakeholders thought uh, make a decision. I remember this is part of what makes it a great job, and you'll appreciate this as Dean. So I, was, I came to the Solicitor General job uh, uh, off my deanship. Um, and I was a pretty assertive dean. You know, I definitely wanted to move the battleship, and I knew which direction I wanted to move the battleship. But still, you had a faculty, and you had students, and you had other people <laughs> who you had to kind of you know, think about as you made decisions, and you had to get buy-in of all kinds. And, um, so my first day, really, as Solicitor General, I convened this big meeting, Defense Department, State Department, every, about a very important matter about um, uh, uh, Guantanamo detainee policy. Mm. And um, came back to the office, and I said to one of my deputies, you know, I don't know, because the D Defense Department wants this, and the State Department wants this, and then the National Security Council wants something else. And my deputy said, well, it's your decision. I said, what do you mean it's my decision? Don't I like have to find like the perfect compromise? And, you know, and he said, uh, you're the Solicitor General. They all know that you're the Solicitor General. You make the call. And I was like, what a great job this is. <laughs> <laughs> Little different so. than Dean, for sure, for sure. Uh, maybe just to follow that thread about the, the SG's office, you, I believe, argued six cases in that. Time you that sounds right, general. yeah, yeah. Uh, can you talk about one or two of those arguments, what's most memorable to you? I think my, the question I posed to you was, what's the good, bad, and the ugly of those three, those six arguments, if you're, if you're willing to share? Uh, well, I'll tell you about my first one. It's probably the one people know best. And um, so this is my, my first one. And um, there are two kinds of SGs, honestly. There are the SGs who are already skilled appellate advocates and experienced ex appellate advocates. And the other career path to the SG comes through academia, and they're um, much less experienced appellate advocates, and I was the other career path. So, so I did not have a whole lot of, uh, and when I say I did not have a whole lot, let's just you know, be frank. Uh, uh, my first argument before the Supreme Court as SG was my first argument before the Supreme Court. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and it was um, in, a, in, in Citizens United, all right? So it was a pretty important case. It was, um, uh, it was a re-argument. It had been heard the year before. A deputy uh, solicitor general had argued it when it was going to be a smaller case. And the court um, decided to make it a bigger case. And it was no secret that the court had done this because um, they, they get to the end of the term and they issue an, an order and it says this case will be re-argued and in re-arguing it we will consider whether to overrule two cases and they named the two cases and they were two cases that were kind of the foundation stones of the court's doctrine about campaign finance regulation. So it was pretty clear that this uh, relatively small case had just become a large case. It was also pretty clear that um, the government was about to lose this large case yeah. because uh, the court just doesn't do things. It was pretty clear that the court was doing this because um, they were much of the way to deciding that they were going to overrule these cases, but that they didn't want to do it without argument. It would have like not been, you know, you, you know, you should have argument about things like that before you do them. And um, 
Uh, so, so it was my case. They called a special session of the court. The court usually convenes first Monday in October. They called a special session in September just to argue this case. So that was my first argument. So it was a, it was, it was a nerve wracking way. No pressure. No, no pressure. pressure. Yeah. Now, in a way, it was an enormous amount of pressure, and in a way, it actually wasn't so much pressure. An enormous amount because it was an important case, and I knew that everybody was. It, 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 to the extent that you thought you could make your debut in private, it was not that. <laughs> um, but a, a little bit, I mean, it was, it was just so clear that, um, and this is sometimes true of SG arguments more than it's true, of, uh, for example, of assistant SG arguments. It was just pretty clear that it, the argument was not going to turn this case one way or the other. I could have done the greatest job in the world and, um, uh, probably the result would have been the result. Um, so in, in that sense, I, I think there was uh, you know, not all that much pressure. But, but I was still pretty nervous. You know, my heart's beating pretty, pretty fast. And I was arguing with three other lawyers, all of whom were marvelous and uh, Supreme Court advocates and, and very experienced. And I thought, for sure, my heart is beating the loudest of anybody in this room. I, I could have sworn that people would have heard it. I got up to the, um, the podium, and I, 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 uh, you know, I had memorized a few sentences, although I knew that the Supreme Court's a hot bench and you get interrupted by lots of questions all the time. Um, I got one sentence out of my mouth, and Justice Scalia had this very distinctive way of leaning over the bench. And he leaned over the bench and he said, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Um, and then he proceeded to tell me why, I, why the single sentence that I had said, which was, which was something about the history of campaign fi finance regulation in America, was completely wrong, you know? Um, but it was actually great. Um, uh, Justice Scalia and I already knew each other quite well. He was a, a Harvard Law School alum, and I had uh, gotten to know him when I was dean, and we had a very good relationship. And um, I'm quite convinced that he did it just to get me in the game. Mm. You know, that it was like this moment of like the voice is a little bit shaky and you know, like I'm standing up here and what do I do now? Now I have to remember the second sentence that I memorized. <laughs> and he just like got me in the game. And, and I, I, I always loved actually arguing to Justice Scalia because he was, he asked very, uh, you know, I'm pointed as sort of an understatement kind of questions. You know, ver you, know, uh, you know, he told you when he didn't agree with you, but then he also uh, gave you a chance to respond and, and, and sort of uh, you felt like he was listening to your response and actually caring what the response was. So, um, so that was my first, my first part of my first argument and it went on from there. And uh, it's, it's pretty fun. I'm a little bit of a ham. You know, I don't know, you might have noticed that already or something, but, um, and, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a performance. Uh, even when you think it, it doesn't matter, like on the one hand, you think this is like kabuki theater, they, they know what they're going to do, but, um, but, uh, but it's, it's uh, you, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to do, and when you do it right, you feel awfully good about it. So both of us were lucky enough to clerk for justices. You already uh, spoke about Justice Marshall saying the SG's job is the best when he has reshaped American law as you know, the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, and Justice Ginsburg, of course, transformative effect on uh, discrimination law, particularly with respect to women before she was a judge in justice. As a, as a justice now, do you look back on clerking for and getting to know Justice Marshall? Um, are the things you learned from him in the way you do your job now? I mean, let's talk about that experience a little bit. I, I think uh, it, it, what I learned from Justice Marshall is, is, is not peculiarly relevant to my, to my job now as, as compared with the rest of my life. I mean, I learned an enormous amount from him. But he was one of the very few, I think, Supreme Court justices where his importance actually had a great deal more to do with what he did in a non-judge capacity than in a judge capacity. Um, uh, he was a good justice, um, but by the time he got to the court, um, he was, you know, in a lot of important cases in dissent rather than in the, you know, governing majority. 
And even in dissent, um, uh, you know, he was, he was junior to Justice Brennan, which uh, in the Supreme Court can mean something. Um, uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg, you know, for the last years of her life was sort of the senior justice often in dissent. Uh, Justice Marshall never played that role. And Justice Brennan, one has to say, was not much of a sharer. He had um, uh, many great qualities, but he kept dissenting opinions, um, the important ones, for the most part, not, not entirely. So, 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 you know, partly it's just as Marshall just wasn't positioned to, and then of course, I mean, I don't know, like you would have had to be, I don't know what kind of justice to, you know, to, even, to hold a candle to what he did before he was justice, because he really did truly reshape American law. I think he was, uh, and reshape American society. Um, uh, with many other people, of course, but I think he was the principal lawyer in the struggle to achieve racial equality, to, um, to eradicate Jim Crow segregation in the United States. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I guess I think he was the greatest lawyer of the 20th century. I mean, um, I, I think certainly he was. And part of that is, is by very obvious sort of uh, standard metrics. I mean, he, he, uh, he did something that like nobody does anymore. He was both an extraordinary appellate lawyer. He did 20 some or 19 or something like that, Supreme Court cases, won almost all of them. Um, he was also a great trial lawyer. Uh, so he you know, traversed the country and especially the South and just appeared in small courthouses in, uh, all, all, you know, in uh, many, many states. And he did um, a lot of criminal work. He also did uh, the big discrimination cases. I mean, he kind of did everything. And then if, and he and did it just extraordinarily well. Um, uh, uh, my, one of my co-clerks at the time, we were clerk, clerking, somehow got a tape. I, I don't know if this is uh, readily uh, available like online, but of his Brown v. Board argument. And it's really quite a stunning uh, argument. Um, uh, and it's funny because um, he didn't actually sound like Justice Marshall. The Justice Marshall we knew kind of had a sort of Southern drawl. And this guy was like speaking the King's English. And um, uh, and my co-clerk said to him, like, why don't you talk like this anymore? And he says, well, I guess I don't have to, mm. you know? Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, he just, uh, so, you know, he was an extraordinary lawyer in all these sort of standard metric kind of ways. But then also it's like, I don't know, if you're going to be the greatest lawyer of the 20th century, maybe the real question is, you know, have you done the most justice? And uh, he did the most justice of, of anybody. Um, yes. and, uh, and it was just such an honor to work for him that year. And, you know, I, I think we felt ourselves the luckiest people in the building, definitely. Um, and I don't know if you had this sense when you were clerking for Justice Ginsburg, who was kind of the women's um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, equality pioneer uh, lawyer. Um, but, you know, we, we felt like, you know, it's a great job to be a Supreme Court clerk for all, you know, and everybody thinks it's a terrific job and you get to be 27 years old and walk around, you know, the Supreme Court building as though you're making these decisions yourself, <laughs> uh, which you're not. Which you're not. Um, uh, but then I think we felt, I mean, my gosh, we're living in the company of this uh, icon of American law and of American history, and and he was an extraordinary storyteller. It's not like he just sort of kept this all to himself. He was actually the best storyteller I've ever met in my life. He had he was a, a kind of raconteur. He had he had facial expressions. He did voices. He played mm -hmm. roles. Uh, he made things come alive, and so. Um, uh, so I think we really felt like, oh my gosh, we're just sort of living through history as this man recounts his life. And was, it, was, it was a pretty special experience. Is that the argument where he says, if we go any slower, we'll be going backwards? Or mm, I don't know that line. What is yeah, that line? It's, it's either from Brown 1 or Brown 2, where he... The, Sounds like a Brown 2 kind of a line. A justice is asking 
maybe we shouldn't go too rapidly. And he says, huh, we are, interesting. If we go any slower, we'll be walking backwards. Okay. Um, I'll, f I'll find it for you and send it. Okay, it's, that's, it's great. A, that's, a, that's a great line. It is a great line. Uh, so uh, you have held a variety of firsts as, a, as the first female dean of Stanford, of a Harvard Law School. You, I'm so you sorry. were the first. I'm sorry. No, you weren't. I wasn't. You weren't, yeah. Kathleen Sullivan was yeah, the first yeah, female yeah, dean yeah. of Stanford Law School. So sorry. Um, um, Harvard Law School, I don't know how I could make that mistake, the first female solicitor general, and while not the first female on the Supreme Court, you're the fourth female on the Supreme Court. How do you think about those milestones, and how do you think uh, the profession is doing with respect to? women and underrepresented minorities in the profession. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, because when I was uh, f the first dean, the, my, f my first first was as dean at Harvard Law School. And, and, and when I got there, like, a lot of people were making sort of a, f a fuss about it. At, at that point, Kathleen had been uh, the, 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 the first dean of a major law school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I was like, well, she's done it already. You know, it's not like a real first first, just, uh, um, and I, I was sort of, sort of dismissive of the whole thing. And then actually I started talking to the women alumni of Harvard, yeah. and I learned not to be dismissive of it. That for uh, all these women who had gone through Harvard Law School in the bad years, and there were lots of bad years, um, uh, it was such a momentous thing to have a woman at the, at the head of the school and, and realized that, you know, even if I sort of thought, oh, look, it's, you know, People I know have done similar things. It was, it was a momentous thing for a lot of, a lot of people. And I think that about um, the uh, women on the Supreme Court, too. Uh, that, you know, sometimes people say, oh, if uh, there are women there, y y y you know, they'll, they'll think differently about the law than men will. And I have to say, I think that that's not usually true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on, in, an, in an occasional, exceptional case, but uh, usually women, you know, the women on this, and I think this, you know, it's become, um, um, you know, with Justice Barrett coming to the court, I mean, Justice Barrett and I, we agree about some things and we disagree about some things. And, and being a woman just, just doesn't have all that much to do with it. Um, but, um, but, I, but I think that the thing, it's, it's, it's I, I used to think like, uh, you would look out in the courtroom, this is in the pre-COVID days when we had an audience, and see all these school groups. And, and, to, and for them, for all these girls and boys, both, um, to see uh, women's faces and women's voices coming from all different directions, um, you know, was, is, was an unbelievable thing. And, um, and now we have four, you know, your old justice, Justice Ginsburg, I think she was once asked, like, how many women is enough? And she said, how about nine? nine, nine, nine. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, but, but, but before seems actually like uh, even more than three and just the, and the sense of um, just, there's a lot of women talking. Uh, and, you know, I, I was just, uh, I, I just saw a bar graph that one of these, uh, I think, I don't know which newspaper published, but it was um, about uh, uh, all the justices on the Supreme Court, and they said, how many words had you spoken in your first eight arguments? All right, that was the mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that the number one, two, three, and four most talkative justices in their first four arguments were the four women. Uh -huh. <laughs> so like none of us are shrinking violets. Um, and, uh, and you go to the Supreme Court these days and, you know, women look like they're, they're in there. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about being dean of Harvard Law School. Uh, what was, you said you, you wanted to move the ship, you knew which way you wanted to move it and you had to persuade a lot of people. Um, uh, is there is one thing in particular that you're particularly proud of from your tenure as dean of Harvard Law School? Um, well, I, I suppose the thing that I'm most proud of and the thing that I knew was my, both my uh, biggest challenge but also my biggest opportunity was when I took over, Harvard had a reputation as not being a very student-friendly pace, mm -hmm. had a lot of students in it, didn't seem to really care all that much. Um, uh, and I think that uh, that was, uh, I mean, it was my biggest challenge, also my biggest opportunity in the sense that it was definitely starting from a low bar kind of place. <laughs> um, uh, so so, so I, I would say that the things that I did to make 
student life better and the student experience better, um, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom meant a lot. Um, I would say, uh, somebody said to me um, once the, the test of any dean is, is the faculty better when you left mm. than when you got there? And I, I think that the, it was. I mean, I added, I, it, was a, it was a good time to be dean. It was flush times. I had a, a fair amount of money to spend. Uh, I added a lot of faculty members. I brought um, uh, a lot of really extraordinary scholars to the law school. Um, one of the things uh, in, in, in that vein that, that I'm proud of is that, um, that uh, those scholars had many different interests and uh, also many different perspectives, so that there was a lot of methodological and ideological diversity to my hires. Um, uh, so I guess that's the second thing. And then the third thing is um, uh, you know, something that I just loved, actually, and I didn't really know anything about it and didn't expect to. But I built a gigantic building. Yes, I mean, did. I didn't build yes, it, you did. but um, <laughs> but it was built, you know, or uh, uh, at least it was planned during my watch, mm -hmm. um, and that was like superbly fun. And I encourage you to build lots of buildings here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is also a question about leading an academic institution and a law school in particular. Is just the the question of free speech on college campuses, as you. Uh, no doubt, <laughs> no, is a, a source of uh, a lot of conversation right now. It's an old issue. You know, you go back to the free speech movement in the 60s. Um, it's, not, it's not really a new issue. And when you were dean at Harvard, did you have an operating theory about how to guard free speech while at the same time having a, uh, a community that felt knitted together, that felt part of the place? You know, operating theory sounds like a high bar. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess you know, my, my theory was you, uh, you should be able to do both of those things that you talked about. You should be able to have people feel that they're being uh, respected, um, and you should also be able to have really vibrant, robust debate. And, um, and, uh, and, 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 and both those things are important. You know, on the first, I think, you know, it's, it's, there are not many ideas that, uh, that you can't convey in, in, you know, res in a respectful way. And indeed, if you're trying to persuade somebody, better to convey them in a respectful than in um, uh, a, you know, a way than in a way that um, hurts people or offends people. You know, on, uh, uh, on the other side of the equation, I mean, it's just really important for people to feel free to express their views. And there's like nothing worse, I think, uh, when you're a teacher uh, than when you introduce a topic and the classroom just sort of shuts down on you because everybody is afraid to say something and afraid they'll be misunderstood or misconstrued or misinterpreted. And, um, and you know, when, when that kind of thing happens, I mean, nobody's learning from each other. So, so, uh, so I guess, you know, if, 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 if I put a thumb on the scales, the thumb on the scales is uh, to encourage uh, robust debate and exchange of views and, and for people to give each other the benefit of the doubt and to think uh, to each other, you know, of each other that even though, you know, you might have said something in a way that I wouldn't have said it or in a way that maybe you don't understand is, um, is, is hurtful in some way, you know, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt in terms of you're approaching this in good faith and, uh, and with good motives and what we're trying to do is to convey ideas and to learn from each other. And that's what uh, a university should be doing. And um, I, it was, I was um, giving a talk like this a month or two ago and somebody asked me, like, what's your favorite Supreme Court opinion? And I realized I had a very, uh, you know, automatic reaction to that. And the opinion, I encourage all of you, especially law students, but actually not just law students, to go read it, is this wonderful concurring opinion by Louis Brandeis in, um, in a free speech case. It was in the days when communists were being thrown in jail. And the question was what to do about that. And, you know, what people know about, if they know about anything about free speech laws, they know, like, Oliver Wendell Holmes and the Marketplace of Ideas, but this is a much more poetic 
and romantic view of free speech. It's about, it's about the role of free expression in a democracy, and it's about the role of free expression in cultivating American citizenry. And it talks about, it talks about how speech is something you can only afford if you are a courageous people. Mm. And, uh, and it's, it's, you know, I can't do justice to it. Um, uh, like I feel like I'm trying and I'm not doing as well as I want to be doing. So go read the thing. But, um, but I basically think, you know, uh, it's really important to a democracy that we be able to speak to each other, um, even about sensitive issues. And if it can't happen in the university, you know, where is it going to happen? Thank you. So you worked in the White House. You were both a legal and a policy advisor to President Clinton. You're now in a very different branch of government. Is it, it, can, you, can you capture in a few words the different ways those branches do business? Everything? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's almost, it's just, uh, it's... Apples it, and oranges. Apples and oranges. Only begins yeah. to... Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, the subject matter, the pace, uh, the relationship with the public. Um, I, I mean, it, it, it all seems very different. I mean, except for the fact that they're both part of the government. <laughs> I, I, would, I, I would say that they don't share all that much in common. When you worked for President Clinton, uh, what is the most interesting thing you worked on that you can talk about? I, 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 I did domestic policy and law, so uh, not foreign policy and security. <laughs> so I can talk about pretty much anything. Um, uh, the, the most interesting thing, I guess I spent quite some time in a, in a losing effort, but one that I think, you know, pushed the can down the road and led to some changes in the future. But it was, uh, it was an effort to uh, enact um, uh, legislation to deal with the uh, costs of tobacco usage. Mm -hmm. So um, in particular, getting the FDA um, regulatory authority over tobacco and doing a bunch of other things to prevent children from smoking. And um, uh, it was a bipartisan effort. Uh, Senator McCain was extremely involved in it. Um, but in the end, it didn't, def it didn't uh, get through the Senate filibuster. Um, so it didn't get, you know, it got over 50. I think we got 56, um, but didn't get 60. Um, uh, but it was, it was, it was I, I think, probably the, 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 the most involved, uh, long-standing uh, uh, project that I participated in. So I want to talk about your, your, your time on the court, as I think the audience knows uh, the questions they would love to ask you. I'm not going to ask you. Okay, okay, that's good. Ob obviously. Because I would just say, you know, I can't, can't talk about that question. That. Right, yeah. exactly. I mean, I guess just to start, you were nominated by President Obama in 2010, as, as Mr. Bach said. And just can you share with, the experience, uh, with us the experience of getting that call and knowing you were going to be nominated? and if there were someone you wanted to call uh, or did call immediately, who was that person and why? Just give us a flavor of that experience. Okay, so, the, so the first thing you have to know was that there were two such calls, but one was good and one was bad. I mean, the bad one came first. So yes. uh, I had just been uh, confirmed to be SG mm -hmm. and Justice Souter stepped down. And, um, and I got a call from the White House Counsel's Office and said, we'd like to consider you uh, to, to be uh, Justice Souter's replacement. And I said, you know, I just got here. And he said, that's true. And that's not, you know, that's, that's a minus. Um, uh, but we want to consider you. And uh, 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 President Obama interviewed four people, of whom I was one, and, uh, and then picked Justice Sotomayor for that seat. And he called me, and he um, delivered the bad news in an incredibly gracious way, mm -hmm. and said that you know he ho he he thought that there might be um, a, a, another another seat, and he would certainly consider me for that. Um, so the second time around, I had had an interview with him. The interview I thought had gone really well. You know, um, uh, President Obama knows a lot about law, 
Uh, he was a constitutional law professor, of course, and I thought it, and, and it was just incredibly fun to sit down and talk with him about law. It was when I was SG, and so he wanted to know a lot about my perceptions of the court, having watched it for the last several months. Anyway, so, you know, he turned me down for that, and I went um, along with my uh, business being SG, which was, as I've told you, an extraordinary job. The best job. The best call, job, actually. exactly. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that suggests that when the second call came, I should have said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm living through the best job in America, I'm not interested. <laughs> but I didn't say that. Uh, you know, if, I guess if you could plan your life, like I would have been SG for three or four more years, but, you know, it doesn't work like that. So, um, so the White House counsel called me again, said we'd like to consider you again. This was for now for Justice Stevens' seat. And um, uh, 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 I went in again for an interview. And this time, the interview actually was extremely bad, because um, that morning, uh, the BP oil spill happened. Ooh. And uh, the president had other things to do. Than, and he literally walked in, and he said to me, uh, I know you. We don't have to talk, right? <laughs> and I was like, OK. <laughs> I, I mean. You're right, like there's the BP oil spill, and then you do, you know, so um, anyway. But, uh, but as the process went along, I could kind of tell that it felt differently um, than the first process had. And so then, uh, in the end, he did call me, and he offered me the job, and he was uh, quite wonderful. And, um, uh, you know, of course, I, I said yes. Uh, you said who was the first person I called. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually called the person who I knew would have called me, um, and that was um, one of the other finalists, ah. uh, was um, now Attorney General Garland, mm -hmm. and, um, and the two of us had known each other for a, a quite long time, ever since I had been a law student, and I was quite sure that if uh, Merrick had gotten the job, I would have been the first person, just mm. because that's the kind of person he is, mm -hmm. so I thought, I should try to be that kind of person, so I, I called Merrick. And mm. given, uh, I mean, and he was extraordinarily gracious. Mm. So uh, from 1971 to your nomination, um, every single justice who was confirmed was a sitting federal or state judge before uh, that time. You were not. And in 1971, uh, Rehnquist and Powell were, had not been uh, judges for, for that time. Do you have a perspective you can share about how you think your prior varied experience sort of contributes to the court in different ways than those who'd been judges before? And what effect, if any, do you think that's had on your colleagues? Yeah, I mean, you know, it used to be that uh, most people were not judges before they were justices. If you go back to the Brown v. Board court, yeah. I, I don't think anybody was. I mean, maybe there was one, but, but I don't, I, I think not. Um, and then as you say, you know, up through uh, Justice Rehnquist, Justice Powell, and then all of a sudden it sort of turned yeah. for various reasons, and now it's very unusual to have uh, an, 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 a non-judge become a justice. Um, uh, I think probably because people are more focused on we have to know exactly what kind of justice you're going to be. Mm -hmm. And the best way to think about that is to see what kind of judge uh, you were. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure it says anything great about the nomination and confirmation process that it's moved in that direction. But, um, but it has, so I was pretty unusual. I honestly think that the Solicitor General's job is, is pretty much the best preparation for mm -hmm. being a, a justice. I, I mean, there are all kinds of preparations, and you can use the, you can do the job with all kinds of different experiences. But the way I looked at it, actually, was that, you know, it's actually a pretty different job to be an appellate court judge and to be a Supreme Court justice. The dockets are extremely different. Um, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, the thing about appellate court judges is that they just have to listen to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has a, a, a bit more, uh, you know, freedom. Um, uh, and then, and then, the, and then the docket, because it's entirely discretionary, is is really different from mo what most um, appellate judges spend their time doing. 
Um, whereas the SG, I mean, all you're thinking about really, or 80% of what you're thinking about is the Supreme Court docket, is the Supreme Court, is, this, uh, is those nine justices up there. And I used to kind of think, it's like, you know, my job last year was to persuade nine Supreme Court justices, and my job this year is to persuade eight Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and it's not all that different. I mean, there were things that I definitely had to learn in my first year that my colleagues didn't. Um, uh, and they were really things about uh, figuring out how I learned best, because like every judge tries to figure out ways of working that it's like, how do I learn the, how do I, how do I, how do I as a, you know, because people learn in all different kinds of ways. So, you know, what processes, what procedures do I use to really get me to understand these cases and to be able to decide them? Um, how do I use clerks? You know, how do I structure a writing process to produce opinions, uh, good opinions in the end? So um, my first year was definitely a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, a trial and error. I had three clerks who had all um, clerked on the Supreme Court before, one for Justice Ginsburg, one for Justice Kennedy, and one for Justice Breyer. And sometimes I would get to uh, a question about how to do something, and I would say, okay, so how did those people do it? Mm -hmm. And then they would give me three completely different answers, you know? And so I would, you know, think about it a little bit and I would pick one. And sometimes it would work great. And other times I would get to the, I would, you know, I, the clerk would do exactly what I told the clerk to do. And it would be the most unbelievable waste of time, you know? And I would say, well, we're never doing that again, right? <laughs> and so that first year was sort of trial and error to, to, to figure out how I learned best and how I, how, you know, what kind of writing process best suited me and all of that. But once that was done, I, I really didn't think that there was any way in which the lack of being a judge, you know, hindered anything very much. Well, and are there ways in which you think your varied experience was an asset? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think everybody brings different things to the table and, uh, 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 I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I you know, I, I, I think, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not selling myself short here, but I'm not sure I can draw a straight line between any particular experience and anything that I distinctively brought to the court. So since you became a justice, you have authored dozens of opinions and lots of concurrences and dissents. Are there opinions of the court that you're proudest of because you think they will have a lasting effect on the law? And then after you answer that, I'll ask you about dissents and how you think about them. Um, you, you know, it's a little bit like choosing among your children or something, mm -hmm. and... You can pick a couple. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, you know, I try to work hard on all of them. Uh, I guess the one um, I'll say a few words about is uh, an, an, an opinion that I have thought about a lot over the years because it's an opinion about precedent. Mm -hmm. It was um, assigned to me by Justice Scalia because he was the senior justice in the majority um, rather than the chief justice. And when he assigned it to me, um, uh, he said, I think that this is a great opinion for you to write, Elena because it's kind of a, a statement opinion. Uh, and mm. he knew that, you know, he knew what my views on this were from the conference discussion. And he said, uh, you know, I think you can, you know, there are not so many opportunities you get around here as a junior justice. And this was like maybe my third year. Um, to, to really say uh, how, you f how, how you think about the doing of law and the business of judging. Mm -hmm. And it was an opinion that his, uh, it, was, it was kind of fun opinion because it's come to be known as my Spider-Man opinion. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's my Spider-Man opinion is because it's a, it's a, it's a question of stare decisis, uh, which means like a question about, about how precedent works and how, how, how far precedent is binding. But it comes up in, a, in the context of a patent case and the patent was on a Spider-Man glove, where uh, you put this glove on and then you could walk around spinning webs with it. And uh, this, of course, 
no end of clerk shenanigans, you know, <laughs> uh, spin, spinning, spinning webs uh, in my chambers. But um, there was this patent doctrine that the case involved, and it was a doctrine that uh, almost certainly would not have been devised in 2015, mm -hmm. you know? That um, uh, it was, you know, a kind, you know, all the all the economists thought that this doctrine made no sense, and um, and and in the and I, th I think it's pretty fair to say that if you had taken a poll of economists, of patent lawyers, or of the justices, just on straight up like, if this were coming to us today, would we devise this rule? Uh, the answer would have been a pretty heavy no. Uh, and the question was whether notwithstanding that, because this rule had existed for quite some number of decades, um, should the answer instead be yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, my answer was instead yes, it should be, because the doctrine of precedent uh, was um, you know, of great importance in our law. Um, and the opinion sort of talks about why that's so. And it's, a, uh, it's an opinion I've gone back to and I've cited a lot of times over the years. And I, I really feel as though, you know, uh, you know I, I said it in my third year on the court and I you know, continue to think about why it is that this doctrine is so important. Do you want to know why? Yes, I do. I think all of us do. Yes. Okay, so I'll tell you why. Uh, I mean, unless you want to go to another question. No, I want to go. Okay. And I want to stay here. Uh, I mean, the first reason, right, is that uh, law should be stable. Um, you know, people depend on law, people rely on law, you give them a legal rule and they order their lives, and they order their conduct, and that's true of, uh, that's true of things that are like economic transactions, it's, and it's true of, uh, of, of non-economic, you know, give, you give people a right, and then you take the right away. Well, in the meantime, they've understood their lives in a different kind of way. So law should be stable. And, uh, and judges should be humble. So um, stare decisis, it's also, it's a doctrine of stability, but it's also a doctrine of humility. And I talked about all of this in, in, in this patent law context, you know? Exactly. It's a, it's, it's, it's a doctrine of humility. It's saying, uh, we get to the court and you know, we think we know everything, but it turns out people have been doing law for a long time before us. And, and the way law develops often, usually, and best is when it develops slowly and incrementally by the work of many judges over time. And, um, uh, and it's a kind of hubris to say, we're just throwing that all out because we think we know better, you know? And, and so that's important. Uh, the judges, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why judges are not humble, you know? There's a lot that happens to me in my <laughs> daily life to make me not humble. <laughs> and, 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 and so this is a doctrine that sort of forces judges to be humble. Uh, and, and, you know, the third reason is it prevents the court from becoming politicized. Um, and again, this is something that, you know, people have been talking about, not just me and Spider-Man, but people have been talking a long time about why do we have this doctrine? Yeah. It's a kind of counterintuitive doctrine. Like if I think something's wrong, why shouldn't I just get rid of it, you know? That seems like a pretty intuitive thought. But, you know, if you have judges and they come on to a court and they say we're sort of overthrowing the apparatus and we're overthrowing legal rules, um, just it starts not to look like law anymore. And, you know, maybe it's tit for tat. Maybe some other justices will come on and they'll do the same thing. And rather than law building in, in this incremental uh, you know, minimalist kind of way over time, there are all these um, jolts to the system. And it begins to look more like, I mean, not like a court, and more like um, a, 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 a political institution. And that's something that the courts, 
you know, need to be incredibly cognizant of and wary about that uh, courts should look like courts. A court should be courts. Courts should act like courts. And um, so, uh, so basically all of these things were talked about in the context of this Spider-Man opinion. And, um, and, you know, I think Justice Scalia was right, that I learned a lot and it committed me to a lot by writing it. And, uh, and I've, I've quoted it a lot ever since. Thank you so much. So this is a, a good segue to talk about how you think about dissents. You've written uh, some very memorable dissents. Last term in particular, you wrote some very significant dissents. Uh, how do you think about dissents, and do you think you've become the dissenter on the court? Um, I think there are different kinds of dissents. Uh, I mean, some dissents, uh, you could imagine not writing, right? You could imagine, it's like, you know, I see it differently, um, but is the world going to change because, you know, I wrote this dissent, probably not. And, you know, in some legal systems, there's a pretty high bar to dissents. And there are some dissents that we write on the Supreme Court that in some legal systems they wouldn't write. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's nothing all that much at stake. I mean, I mean, it matters to the parties, and maybe it matters. To, but you know that, um, uh, uh, you know, once you've written the dissent, you're going to get on the train again. And, uh, you, you know, you, you, you know, law's hard. And people can sometimes look at a legal question in two different ways. And yet you understand that, um, yeah, it's pretty close and, and the world does not depend on this. And a lot of dissents at the Supreme Court are like that. Mm -hmm. And you sort of try to convey that in the way you write the dissent. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some dissents are something more. I mean, I don't know if you uh, were, when you were clerking on the court, whether there were any dissents that were spoken from the bench, were there? A couple. A yes. couple. Yeah, so it's a pretty high bar to it do is. that. And, and that's sort of the way I think about it. There are sort of ordinary dissents. Mm -hmm. And then there are the kinds of dissents that you speak from the bench, the kind where you think uh, something you know, very important is at stake. And, 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 and you're not just going to get back on the train. In other words, you, know, you realize that there are going to be other cases uh, coming down the pike, which are going to involve similar issues, not usually the same, but similar is issues. And you're going to approach it from a different vantage point than the majority does, and that that's going to continue to be the case, and that you want uh, almost to give notice of that. And, and at the same time, to speak to the future and to say, you know, um, this court has made a decision but there are various ways to remedy or to limit or to um, uh, cabin um, mistakes, and, um, and we should be looking to do that and to, and to uh, you know, give people some guidance or, or give people some hope that that, that, that might happen. And, and so those couple a year, right, those you know, uh, b before, COVID struck and we didn't announce our opinions anymore. Um, I think I had done it three times mm -hmm. in about uh, uh, 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I probably would have done it a few more last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, those are, those are important things to say. And, you know, am I the dissenter? No, I think that, you know, um, uh, your old boss, you know, was a, 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 you know, was a wonderful dissenter. I mean, um, when I wrote um, m my dissent in one voting rights case, which was a case called Brnovich, um, uh, and a case about Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, I mean, I reread Justice Ginsburg's dissent in Shelby County, which was a case about Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and, you know, it kind of moved me to tears. Um, so, uh, so, so, you know, I take that part of the job really seriously. I mean, there are, there are other people, there are, there are lots of people who, 
descend sometimes on the court and some people who descend more than sometimes and you know so I mean it takes all of us but um, uh, 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 you know it's an important role to play thank you uh, this is a question about how do you all get along when you disagree with each other so much? I can ask it in a very precise way, which is you went on a hunting trip with Justice Scalia. Why'd you do that? And is that related in any way to how you all work together and get along, even though you have pretty profound disagreements as evidenced by some of these dissents from the bench? Um, why did I do that? I did it because I promised to. <laughs> So um, there, there is actually a story about this, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell the Please. story. But, but then I'll get back to the, uh, 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 the, the bigger question here. Uh, so when I'm going through the confirmation process, uh, you go through a set of courtesy visits, which is you go from office to office uh, and you speak with senators, sometimes with their aides as well. And, um, and the questions that I was asked the most was, um, was, were about guns and gun policy and the Second Amendment. And, and everybody knows that you can't tell them how you're going to vote on a case. So they try to figure out ways of figuring out what you think, you know, in, in sort of more subtle ways or something. And I got basically a lot of questions about, have you ever hunted? Uh, do you know anybody who's hunted? Um, Clever. Do you know anybody who knows anybody who's hunted? <laughs> Uh, and you know, I grew up in New York City, and and in New York City, this is really not what we did on the weekends, you know. Uh, so um, so there was a, 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 a one senator, and he was a real hunter, and he came from a state where there are a lot of hunters, and um, and where you know people, uh, where many people have um, guns, and many of them, and. Uh, and he said, I, I just don't have any confidence that you could possibly understand how important this is to my constituents. And that's a, a totally reasonable thing for somebody to say. And he said, like, how, you know, uh, and, and, and he was talking a little bit about his hunting. And he had, he had, a, he had a, a ranch and he hunted various um, uh, game. And, and I said, you know, Senator, I said, um, uh, you know, I, I didn't grow up where I had an opportunity to do this, but if you'd like to invite me to your ranch, I'd love to come hunt with you. And this look of total horror came over his face. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the, uh, you always have like a, a White House person who's sitting next to you, and, she, and she's just going <laughs> like, you know. Uh, and uh, so I realized I had probably, you know, stepped a little bit too far, and I said, well, I, I said, I didn't really mean to invite myself hunting with you. I said, I'll tell you what I'll promise is, uh, if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed to the court, um, I, I'll ask Justice Scalia to take me hunting, because I knew Justice Scalia to be an avid hunter. And so I got to the court, and I, this was the only promise I made in 82 office visits. <laughs> and, um, and I got to the court and I went to Justice Scalia, who, as I said before, I had, I had already come to know pretty well. And I told him this story. He thought it was the funniest thing in the world. <laughs> um, Justice Scalia had a great sense of humor and he was just sort of laughing uproariously. And he, um, he said, we're gonna do this. He, um, he took me to his gun club. He, has, he had um, a son-in-law who was a great shot and he taught me to shoot and you know, taught me all about gun safety, did everything you know, the way it should have been done. And then um, uh, uh, I went out hunting with Justice Scalia and his hunting buddies. Not once, many times. Um, uh, so we did a lot of bird shooting together in various parts of Virginia, near where you used mm -hmm. to, you know, in Charlottesville, near Richmond, mm -hmm. both of those places. Um, he took me duck hunting once, which was great, in Mississippi. And he took me game hunting once in Wyoming, which I didn't like. I, I, I ended that trip, I said, no more of that. Um, but, the, the, uh, but the bird shooting we used to do a couple of times a year uh, before he died. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I enjoyed his company very much. I enjoyed the activity very much. And uh, so, um, so what was the question here? The bro uh, well. We got a great answer, whatever the question was. Uh, the question the, the was, broader point is how, how you obviously got along with Justice Scalia, yeah. although you had profound differences about judging. Yeah. How more generally do you think about 
getting along with your colleagues even though you have Right. I mean, we do various things to try to make us more collegial, and it's, you know, um, uh, we go to lunch a certain number of times a week, mm -hmm. and at those lunches we have a rule that we can't talk about the cases. So that, you know, we just talk about the normal things that normal people talk about. We talk about baseball, we talk about music, we talk about grandchildren, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that the idea behind it is that we should all get to know each other as human beings, and when you all get to know each other as human beings, um, uh, it's easier to talk about hard uh, work things in a way that's, that's, uh, that, that is productive and collaborative. Um, and uh, so I think it's good we do all those things. I mean, I think, you, you know, Justice Scalia and your boss, mm -hmm. old boss, of course, were very close friends. They went to India and rode elephants together, yes, according to that picture in her office, exactly. right? Um, but, opera, um, Gilbert like, and Sullivan. Opera, right. All of this is good. Uh, it's, it's very good. You know, it's like some, some of the things that they say about Congress these days is that nobody really has dinner with each other because they're all scurrying home to their, to their districts. And, and so it's good. But it's good for a reason, I think. I mean, it's, I don't see why anybody should care that, you know, I can talk to some of my colleagues about baseball mm -hmm. unless that becomes a way for a better, more collaborative relationship about our cases and about work. And I think it's, it's in service of mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the test, right, is, um, you know, do we engage with each other in a way that, um, uh, in a way that uh, attempts to find common ground in a way that fosters principled compromise, you know, or is that, is that sort of beyond us? And, uh, and you, for me, like I really want it to be the first. Um, but that's a work in progress, you know, that's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, some years are better than other years. And, um, you know, you said, like, do I think of myself as the dissenter? Mm -hmm. um, and you hope that you don't have to think of yourself that way. I mean, last year I thought of myself that way for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, I think it would be a really bad thing if, the, if, if, uh, if, if that was just what the court is going to be like, you know. And I guess, like, I, 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 the way I like to think of myself is as a clear-eyed optimist, mm -hmm. you know, that I'm clear-eyed about the challenges and the difficulties, but still remain hopeful. But, I mean, time will tell, you know? Time will tell whether this is a court that can, uh, you know, get back to find, trying to, you know, to, to find in common ground, to find, to ratcheting down the level of decision making so that we can reach compromises, because that's usually the way you do it, mm -hmm. is like you, it's really hard to agree on huge things. So you ratchet down the questions so that you can agree on small things, mm -hmm. uh, which is better at any rate for the law, because law should move in small steps rather than in big steps. So, you know, is, 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 I, I, is the court going to be that, which I think that's the way for a court to best operate or, or, or not? In which case, I will spend a lot of my time dissenting. And I think, you know, time will tell. Thank you. All right, is there, is there, we're coming to the end of our time. Is there a question you hoped I would have asked you but I didn't ask you yet? We've been over a lot. We really have. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, can I end with a couple of those lightning round type questions, which I think folks tend to love and will learn a little bit more folks about? Folks like these folks, as folks opposed like to, like, folks. not really the person being asked them. <laughs> 
Okay, you can just reject a question. Okay. Like, okay. So, do you have a favorite novel? Um, like a old novel, Middle March. Mm -hmm. um, a more contemporary novel. Uh, I'll give you two: uh, Wolf Hall and Lincoln in the Bardo. Oh. Uh, favorite binge-worthy TV? I, I still like think that The Sopranos is the best. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a big. I was a big Game of Thrones fan until the last season. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, completely, completely. Kind of jump the shark. Yeah, kind of jump the shark. Uh, um, if you have a day off, what do you like to do? Uh, these days, I golf. Um, <laughs> if you could be anything, you can assume whatever talent you'd like to have, whatever, you know, professional baseball, professional musician, king or queen, whatever, you can uh, assume, uh, assume, like assume a can opener, you know, the, the economists, um, anything other than Supreme Court Justice or Solicitor General of the United States, <laughs> what would it be? Um, this is like where your old boss would say, I want to be a diva. Yes, right? she that was, yes, that she was, would. That was just a And there were experience. ways in which she was. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I sort of like this law biz. Um, I don't know, how's it being a university president? It's a great gig. I highly recommend it. it. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Well, all right. I, I recommend it. All right. Uh, last question. Um, you are a poker player. Right? Uh, I play poker. You play poker. Okay, Which oh, is enough. different from being uh, a poker okay, player. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. You play poker. Uh, yeah, right. it's, it's not your day job, I understand. <laughs> um, uh, you play poker. Do you have any particular, well, what's your game? Do you have any particular skills, and do any of them come in handy as a justice? Um, the game that I'm a part of mm -hmm. is a game where they play uh, Texas Hold'em for a while, and then they switch to Omaha. Okay. So that's the game that, although I still have this feeling, this, you know, that what I used to play like in my old college days for, you know, seven card stud high low. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we could start that game. Okay. okay let's do <laughs> um, uh, do I have any particular skills? I'm really not a very good poker player, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know, I enjoy it, but uh, so no, and so I, I guess not. <laughs> Uh, well, if, even if you don't have the skills that come from poker, you're a pretty fantastic justice anyway, so <laughs> don't worry about it. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you for this conversation. And I know the audience here and those who watched the live stream really enjoyed it, and it was uh, fascinating, and uh, I learned a lot, and I suspect the room did too. So. Well, thanks for your questions. Thank they you were great. Much. Thank you very much. Are we supposed to leave?